Amen. If you have your Bible, I'm in Revelation 4 this morning. Revelation chapter 4. It's going to be our text. And uh, we are sort of getting back to back to school mode right now, right? Whatever that's going to look like. Uh, I have one who's uh, headed to a public school this year, and he's slated to be back this week. And the other two at Faith got the call this week that they would not be back this week. So we're just uh, riding the wave. Amen. So uh, we have some older ones who are ready to see their friends, but my two are rejoicing in three more, month, three more weeks of summer, amen? Uh, so uh, they're rejoicing in that. We live in strange times, don't we? We ride the wave as it comes, and we do our best to hold on to our, uh, our bearings in the meantime. Well, I want to take a moment this morning from Revelation 4, and I want to remind you of some solid truth that will get you through shaky times today, amen? And I want us to look to the word of the Lord. Every year, the teacher begins, most every school year, by reviewing the lessons from the end of the previous school year. You don't just dive right into new material, right? You have to review. Whenever you start a class, you have to be reminded sometimes of the base knowledge from the previous class. Otherwise, you find yourself having to flip back a little bit and catch yourself up and get your mind back the way that it ought to be. Well, I believe in this back to school season, it would be good for us to review real quickly this morning some basic truths that all God's people ought to remember, especially as we walk through the difficulty and crazy times that we find ourselves in today. Revelation chapter four, I want to read the first, um, first eight verses. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald and around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Would you read that last verse with me? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. May God bless the reading of his word and his people said, when John writes the book of Revelation, it was a very dark time for him personally and for the church collectively. They were going through a very difficult day. Her church history tells us that Nero, the wicked Roman emperor, had begun a persecution of Christians during his reign. It is said that he set fire to the city of Rome and played his fiddle on the rooftop while it burned. He was probably insane and demon-possessed. Then, in order to shift the blame, he blamed the Christians in order to have to get the heat off of him for the event and to have an excuse to be able to persecute them because they would not worship him as God. When Nero had gone so far as to publicly execute both Peter and Paul, uh, two great leaders in the early church, when John writes, a new emperor is on the throne, his name is Domitian, and Domitian has taken the persecution to a whole other level. It's even worse than it was. Nero was wicked, and but Domitian makes it widespread and rampant. He didn't just arrest a few key leaders or focus in on the ones around Rome. He opened up persecution throughout the empire. In fact, he opened it up in such a way that you were encouraged to turn your neighbor 
neighbor in if they were a Christian. If you were found guilty of following Christ, the government would confiscate your property and give it to the person who turned you in. So there was great incentive for your neighbor to rat you out and to inform on you to the governmental leaders. That's the world they were living in. They were being arrested. Their homes and property confiscated. Many were being killed for sport in the Colosseum. John himself, according to tradition, we don't know this to be fact, but early church tradition suggests that he survived being boiled in oil and then was exiled on the Isle of Patmos and was possibly physically blind while he was there. We don't know that for sure, but early tradition cites that as a possible truth. Revelation 1, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Say in the spirit. I want to tell you, I hope you're in the spirit on the Lord's day. Just because it's the Lord's day and you're in the Lord's house doesn't mean you're in the spirit. Amen? That's a choice we must make. We must choose to worship in spirit and in truth, to be in the spirit. John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. When John was praying and worshiping Jesus alone during his quarantine on a Sunday morning on Patmos, God violently ripped back the curtain between this world and the next world. John's sin, his damaged eyes, his burn damaged eyes could see the invisible and he writes to Christians in the midst of a great temporary crisis and reminds them of several great truths. He says, it's back to school review time. Let me tell you about some things that you need to be reminded of. Christians already knew them, but they were losing sight of them. Why? Because they're facing difficult times. Can I tell you, if there's one thing that threatens to us, if there's one thing that causes us to lose our grip on who God is and what Jesus has provided for us, it is going through trial and difficulty. Whenever you receive a sudden jolt, it's easy to lose a grip on whatever you're holding in your hand. Have you ever been riding down the road holding a drink when all of a sudden your husband or wife driving hits the brakes? It's easy to lose a grip whenever you have a sudden bump, isn't it? Well, I want to tell you we're in a season where we're getting bumped pretty often. And if we're not careful, we will lose our grip on the great truths that we believe and know. So I want to remind us of three of them today that John saw, though blind, that John saw in the spirit when he couldn't see them in the natural, and three truths that will help us get through the difficulty we currently face. The first one is this. These are simple, but they're true. Number one, God is still on the throne. Say that with me. God is still on the throne. Verse two said, immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. One sat on the throne. Say one. One. There's only one who sits on the throne of the universe. Amen. And it isn't up for re-election or vote. It isn't by appointment. It is, that seat is permanently, irrevocably held by the God of all glory. He is on the throne. Amen. In the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, one of the saints saw him and he was on the throne. Amen. When Isaiah saw him in Isaiah 6, he said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. The Bible says that when Stephen saw him, he was standing at the right hand of the throne of God. When John saw him at the end of Revelation, he was on the throne. From the first page of Genesis to the last page of Revelation, God has not moved. He was, he is, and he always will be on the throne. He reigns forever and ever. Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Give the Lord praise for that today. Amen. The Lord reigns. He's on the throne. We often feel like life is out of control. Well, the reality is life has always been out of our control. Control is a myth. It is an illusion. You and I are actually in control of very little about our lives. And it doesn't take but one bad day to reveal that to us. Amen? In fact, the illusion of control is often a lie the devil wants you to believe. So you will rebel against God and disregard or ignore his commandments and live any way that you just choose to live. But just because something is out of your hands doesn't mean it's out of God's hands. 
It's out of your control, but it isn't out of control. People say, oh, the world's out of control. No, it isn't. The history is not a driverless chariot. The world is not bounding toward ruin and no one is at the wheel or God's asleep at the, at, at the, at the helm. That isn't true. God is still on the throne. John said, I saw the throne and there was one still sitting on that throne. Amen. He has all authority in heaven and earth. When Queen Elizabeth was crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury, he laid the crown on her head with these words. He said, I give thee, O sovereign lady, this crown to wear until he who reserves the right to wear it shall return. One day, Jesus is coming and every sovereign and every ruler, every prime minister and every president and every dictator will bow at his feet and they will cast their crowns down and acknowledge they belong to him. Any power that the government has today is borrowed from the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day he will demand it back along with a full accounting for what those leaders and rulers did with that borrowed power power and authority while they had it. So Christian, relax. Our God reigns forever and the Lord is still on his throne. Say he's on the throne. And number two, the second great truth that'll anchor you in times like these is this. Christ is still with his church. Say that with me. Christ is still with his church. Again, notice the 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 word of God this morning. John had the vision of God the Father and he was on the throne governing and guiding the universe. But he also had a vision of the Lord Jesus. And notice where Jesus was. Chapter one, verse 12 and 13 says, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now, what does this mystery mean? Verse 20, we'll unpack it for you. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So where is Jesus in the midst of the golden lampstands? If the lampstand is the church, then Jesus is walking in the midst of his church. That's where you'll find Jesus. Jesus is still with his church. Amen. So if you're looking for Jesus, go to church. Amen. Amen. If you're looking for Jesus, join us in God's house. Tune in today. Jesus is with his people where he always has promised to be. He's standing with his church. He said in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Jesus is right where he said he would be. Amen. In both John's gospel and the book of Revelation, numbers are significant. And the word seven in the Bible is the number of completion. Amen. The woman at the well met six men and none of them could satisfy her heart. But when she met Jesus, number seven, everything changed in her life. Amen. Seven is the number of completion. It's a divine number. It's the number of God. The beast number is six, six, six. A man's number is six, but God's number is seven. Even that one man who is uh, the ruler over all men is less than God. He may be three sixes, but he's not a seven, amen? Even the Antichrist in all his human power will never be able to touch and rival who God is and the authority Jesus has. Well, he uses the number seven here for the church, seven churches in Asia. Now, if you read those seven churches, they're listed sort of in a semicircle. It would have been the postal route in which these letters would have been delivered. So he starts with the first one and works his way around Asia Minor. These were seven literal churches that he's writing to. But the number seven is also symbolic of the church in all times and all places, the fullness of God's church. In other words, from the moment that Jesus breathed the Holy Ghost out on the church in Acts chapter two, until he comes again and raptures that church and takes them home to be with him, where is Jesus? Jesus, walking in the midst of the lampstands. Jesus is with his church. Jesus is among his people. That's where he is. He is the Christ of the candlesticks. He is the Lord of the lampstands. He is not watching from a distance, hoping it works out all right. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a very 
present help in the time of trouble. Then he goes on to say, the Lord of hosts is where? With us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God is with us today. That is the promise. Amen. So God is still on the throne and Christ is still with his church. And the third great truth today is this. His people still win in the end. Say that with me. His people still win in the end. This is the truth of God's word. This is the truth of the book of Revelation. Many Christians don't like to read Revelation. Many Christians are terrified by the book of Revelation. I don't understand that. It was a book written for your encouragement. The Bible said, blessed is the man who reads the words of this book. There's a blessing in just reading the book of Revelation. Amen. God promised you'd be blessed if you read it. So read it. Listen, the point of the book is not to terrify you. The point of the book is to encourage you. The point of the book was this. God's people were living in a day when it looked like the devil and the government and everything around them was about to swallow them up and destroy them. They were a small group, a minority number in the world. There were only a few believers in Jesus in the first century. The church had not exploded to every country like like we see it now. The church was not a dominant force in the culture like it has been in our culture that we've grown up in. They were on a very different playing field than you and I inherited. They were on the bottom of the the bottom rung of the ladder. They were the low man on the totem pole, so to speak. They had every reason to be fearful and afraid, and it looked like the mighty Roman Empire would grind them to dust, just like it had done every other enemy that had risen up against it. They felt like they had no power or or place or authority. Many of the Christians were slaves or former freed slaves. Many of them were uh, just low men on the totem pole. There, a lot of them weren't rich. A lot of them weren't wealthy. Not many of them had positions of authority or power. Some did, but not many. And so they had every reason to be fearful of the world that they lived in. And John writes this book to remind them, no matter what it looks like now, no matter how chaotic it may seem, there is a truth behind what you see and you can be encouraged by that. I'm reminded of that great picture in Isaiah 6 when Isaiah sees the Lord, right? He's also living in a time of political turmoil and uncertainty. Uzziah had died and no one knows what's going to happen next. The throne in Jerusalem is empty. But in that moment, God gives Isaiah a vision and he realizes that the throne in Jerusalem may be empty, but the throne in heaven is still occupied and he doesn't have to be afraid. In that moment, when everything sort of shifts away, Isaiah sees the reality. He sees the truth behind the facts. Say that with me. The truth behind the facts. You see, there's the facts and then there's the truth behind the facts. The Bible tells us, I talked to you a couple weeks ago about Elisha who the Lord uh, had him, his servants see the army surrounding them and he prayed for him, Lord, open his eyes and he saw the enemy's chariots and they were still there. The facts had not changed. But then he saw in addition to the facts, the greater truth and the greater truth was, yes, the enemy was surrounding Elisha, but there was another army surrounding his enemy and that was the angel armies of God. What John is trying to do is help his people have a moment like that. A moment like Isaiah had where they see the throne in heaven ruling over the empty throne of earth. A moment like Elisha's servant had when we're not dismissing the reality of the difficulty and chaos around us. We're just reminding ourselves that behind that is an even greater reality and that is God is still on the throne, Christ is still with his church, and God's people People are still going to come out victorious in the end because Christ guarantees us that. In Revelation 5, John sees Jesus again. He has a vision of God, the Father, holding a book, a scroll with seals on it. Now, you may not know what that looks like because when we think of a book, we think of a codex that looks like this. It's got the pages like this. That's not the picture. John would have been looking at a scroll, and when you go to open the scroll, it was sealed up. And you can, the way a seal would work is you would open the scroll, and there might be a seal a little bit further. And you had to be authorized to break that seal and keep rolling the scroll out so you could keep reading the book. Well, the Bible tells us that when John saw this book, it 
it had seals. It had seven seals. And you would read and then you would hit another seal. And then you would read and hit another seal. And you had to be authorized to open those seals. To break that seal, if you were not authorized to do so, was punishable by death. You weren't allowed to do that. You had to be authorized. Say authorized. You had to have authority. Well, the scroll that God is holding in Revelation 5 is no ordinary book. It is the book that reveals the future of the world. It is the book that shows how human history is going to play out. It's the book that answers the question, how does this thing end? How does it end? How does the story end? Does it end well or does it end poorly? Did God's people come out on top or are they swept away and crushed by their enemies? How does the story end for us, for everyone else, for the entire universe? And how do we ever know? Verse four of chapter five says, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, there stood a lamb having been slain. Wow. I love that. Here he is, the lamb who was slain. Revelation 5 verse 6. Jesus Christ controls the destiny of the universe. That is what we declare every time we say that Jesus is Lord. It's also what got the early church in great trouble because in order to be a good Roman citizen every year, they would wheel a statue of Caesar's image on a cart into your neighborhood. And everyone in the Roman Empire was required to come out of their home, take incense and sprinkle them into the fire and burn incense as an act of worship to Caesar's statue and to declare three words, Caesar is Lord. And you can understand why Christians were unwilling to do that. Number one, they weren't going to burn incense because it was an act of worship. And number two, they weren't going to state that Caesar was Lord because you had to, in order to be a Christian, you had to confess that Jesus is Lord. You see, in order to be a good Roman, you had to say Caesar is Lord and worship him. But the Christians had another tradition. In order for you to be baptized in water and admitted to God's church, you had to confess three words. And those three words were Jesus. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and so there's a conflict on its face. They can't both be Lord. Remember, there's only one on that throne. One. And here it is. And so the Romans and the Christians are at loggerheads. The Christians refused and shouted back, no, Jesus is Lord. And the emperor said, I'll show you. And he had the Christians tortured and killed. What was John's answer? How did Pastor John encourage the seven congregations that he led? He said, very soon Jesus will show the entire world who's really in charge of the universe. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess his lordship. How does the story of human history end? What happens to the people of God who are currently suffering and even being persecuted for his name's sake? Does the light defeat the darkness? Does the wrong ever get put right? Do disease and famine ever cease? Do the nations ever stop fighting one another? Does death have the last word? Do the devil and his horde win the war when it's all said and done? There is only one person in the entire universe who is worthy to break the seals on tomorrow, to unlock the scroll of the future, to implement the plan and purpose of God in judgment and redemption, to bring the story of human history to its proper conclusion. And that person is Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood and purchased us on Calvary's cross and rose from the dead in victory. Christian, we don't have to fear anything. The Lord reigns. We don't have to fear governmental control. Our God still sits on the throne of the universe. We don't have to fear economic collapse. Jesus holds the seven stars in his hand and he still holds every one of us in that same nail-pierced hand. Revelation 1.17 says we don't even have to fear sickness, disease, or death itself. He laid his right hand on me and said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. 
I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Why were the early Christians willing to renounce everything uh, and follow Jesus? Why were they willing to die rather than turn their back on their faith in Christ? Because they were convinced Jesus was who he claimed to be. They were convinced they served a risen Savior, a living Lord who'd walked out of the grave and was able to bring them out of their grave one day, even if they died. It's hard to make a man afraid of death when the the master that he follows rose from the dead by his own power and when they saw him raise people from the dead. Death really starts to lose its grip, its fear on you at that point (laughs) because you understand you serve the only one who's able to wake you up on that great getting up morning. Amen? Hear me today. We've read the back of the book and we win The book says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Take heart, child of God. Listen to the back to school review this morning. There are some great truths that will anchor our heart in the shaky times that we're in. God is still on the throne. Christ is still with his church and his people still win in the end. But I want to tell you, unless you choose to be in the spirit on the Lord's day, like John was, you'll miss it. You won't recognize it and it will affect you. Amen. I can always tell when something bad is going on out there because it affects the temperature of our worship in here. I wish that wasn't the case for us. If As we grow and become more mature in God, it won't be the case for us. As we learn to fix our eyes on God and believe God's truth, it will be less and less true for us because we will understand that we don't worship in response to what is going on around us. We worship in response to the truth that God is on the throne, that Jesus who died holds us in his nail-scarred hand and he will bring us back even from death one day and that we and his people come out on the right side of history after all because Jesus will return and rule the nations. He will be crowned king forever and ever. I want to close with this. Revelation 4 begins, verse 1, with this little word that says, a door was opened in heaven. Say a door. The door was opened so John could see in and see what was going on. In fact, the door opened and a voice said, John, come up here into the door, step up and let me show you what's going on from our vantage point. In Revelation chapter three, however, the chapter ends with a statement about a door as well. And I believe those two statements are connected. I believe the door in Revelation 3.20 and the door in Revelation 4.1 are the same door. I believe it's the same door. I believe John is making a point. What is the point? Here's the point. At the close of Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I stand at the door and knock. Now, why was Jesus having to stand at the door? What door was he standing in? He was standing at the door of the church of Laodicea, the church that had grown lukewarm and lost their zeal and passion for God. He was standing at that door. So here Jesus is. Now, we just said he's walking in the midst of his churches. But when Jesus comes to the church of Laodicea, he finds the door locked and he's not permitted in. Isn't that sad for there to be a church where Jesus isn't permitted in? And yet, I would argue we live in a day where there's quite a few churches where Jesus isn't permitted in or welcomed. Amen. I want to tell you, if you preach a message that disregards God's word, you're saying Jesus isn't welcome in your church. If you soft sell sin and don't preach holiness, then Jesus isn't welcome in your church because he's not going to hang out with that. Amen. If you don't preach the whole Bible rightly divided, you're telling Jesus he isn't welcome in your church because he wants his word to be proclaimed and exalted. If you tell the Holy Ghost he can't move and the gifts aren't welcome, then Jesus isn't welcome in your church. There are some churches where Jesus isn't welcome. Amen. Where he stands outside the door. But the church of Laodicea, the door is shut because they're lukewarm. They're not passionate about Christ. 
They're just going through the motions. And because they're going through the motions of worship and they're not engaging their heart in worship, they can't see what John sees. John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. And so when he comes to church, the door opens and he can see from heaven's point of view and he can see what other people can't see. He knows the world is in turmoil. He knows he's on the island of Patmos. He knows Domitian is persecuting Christians. He knows how bad it looks for the people of God. But whenever John worships, whenever John opens his heart and prays and seeks the face of God, whenever John enters into the Lord's house on the Lord's day in the spirit, he's able to see the reality that God is still on the throne. Jesus is still with his people and God is still moving history forward to its climax. And we don't have to fear the present because the future is going to end well for us. But if you're lukewarm, you can't see that. The door is closed. You can't see into heaven. You can't see from heaven's point of view. Do you get it? And so Jesus knocks on the door of the church and says, if you're discouraged and you think the world is spinning out of control around you, maybe it's because you've got the door shut. Maybe it's because you aren't opening the door of worship. You aren't opening the door of prayer. You aren't opening the door and reading God's word. You aren't opening the door and getting in the spirit and allowing what you know to be true from God's word to affect you the way it ought to. How do you know the difference? Whenever we gather and everything around us mutes our worship, we are not in the spirit. We're just in the house. But our heads are very much in what's going on in the world. But when we are in the spirit on the Lord's day and we allow God's word to inform our belief system and we're living out of that and we're anchored in that, no matter what is spinning around us, we're able to come and open our hearts and lift up our voices and sing, he is still true, he is still faithful, he is still loving, he is still almighty, he is still God, he is still ruling and reigning and he's got me and he's got this and I can still have joy and I can still have peace and I can still hold on to my victory but the only people who can do that are the people who open the door in worship so I want to say to you today is your door open or is your heart shut because if you shut the door you're going to be stuck in there with you and the news (laughs) and I can tell you where that's going to take you mentally under in a hurry but if you'll open the door of worship If you'll open the door to your prayer closet, if you'll open the the, the Bible, if you'll open your mouth in praise, if you'll open your heart in prayer, you'll open the door to heaven and you'll see from heaven's vantage point and you'll be reminded of the truth as it is in Jesus. Stand with me all over God's house today. Can I tell you today, if you've never opened the door to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today would be a great day to do that. Open the door. (laughs) He's standing, he's knocking, but you have to open the door. The lock's on your side. You've got to open the door. Have you ever opened the door? If not, trust him today as Savior. But remind you today, Jesus isn't writing about standing outside the heart of someone who doesn't know him. He's writing about standing outside the church door that does know him. Let me ask you today, have you grown lukewarm in your love or your passion for Christ? Have you cooled off during the pandemic? Are you falling into old patterns of sin and bondage and disobedience? Are you finding yourself, finding it difficult to pray and to worship and to read God's word? I want to tell you, be careful today. You don't want to grow lukewarm. You don't want to cool off in this season. It's easy to do it. We must be deliberate about opening the door in worship. Deliberate about seeking God. Deliberate about hearing his word and living by faith in it. Has difficulty overwhelmed your heart? Have the trials of life stolen your peace? Are you more aware of the earthly difficulties around you than the presence of Christ with you? Does God seem distant and far away? You lost your passion for Christ and his kingdom? Open the door of worship and catch a fresh vision of Christ and his kingdom today. It will help you more than you ever know. Will you enter the door? That's the call. That's the invitation. Pastor Chad's going to lead us in a song this morning. And as we pray, I want you to take a moment before we break for Sunday school. And if you, I hope you have already, but if you haven't, will you take the last two or three minutes of this service? Will you open a door that maybe you've had shut? Will you intently 
Focus all your heart and attention on the Lord. Oh, pastor, we've worshiped, I know, but a lot of us, if we're honest, have worshiped with a divided mind. Singing the words, but we're still thinking about everything else. Give the Lord some undivided attention. Because whatever has your attention has you. And the way that we'll walk in peace and joy is if we choose to think about what is good and right and lovely and pure and praiseworthy. Think on these things. And then what do you do? Well, the next verse says, what do you do? Well, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. If you try to think about what is good and right and wholesome and biblical and those old thoughts keep crowding in, that's okay. What do you do? You turn the worry session into a prayer meeting. You just invite God into the conversation about them. Lord, as I'm sitting here trying to worship you, my mind keeps thinking about all this stuff. That's okay. Just bring that stuff into the conversation and use it as as something to pray about. Don't Don't let worry drive you out of your prayer closet. Let worry drive you into your prayer closet. Amen? Bring that stuff right into the prayer meeting with you. Bring those anxieties. People says, oh, well, the Bible says don't be anxious. Let me tell you how not to be anxious. It's not just a switch you can turn off. If you've ever been anxious, you know I'm telling the truth. What do we do? How do we not be anxious? Here's how. Casting all your cares, same word, casting all your anxieties on him. It's not that I never feel anxious. It's that I choose in those moments of anxiety instead of stewing in it alone to lift my heart up and bring them to God in prayer. And if I will think on what is right and I will bring my worries to God in prayer, there is a great promise for me. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. God's peace will guard you But you've got to focus your mind on what's right and you've got to lift those anxieties up in prayer to the Lord and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Pray with me, Father. Lord, I've done my best in just a few moments to unpack just a reminder for all of us today that, Lord, what we believe is true is still true. It's still true in the middle of all of it. So, Father, today we pray that, Lord, you would do a work. Lord, We pray that, God, you would turn our hearts and our minds towards you. The Lord, we would find the peace of Christ in the midst of all of this. In Jesus' name, God's people said,